I was the first man to fall in love with you, son of Clinius, and now that the others have stopped pursuing you, I suppose you're wondering why I'm the only one who hasn't given up, and also why, when the others pestered you with conversation, I never even spoke to you all these years. Human causes didn't enter into it. I was prevented by some divine being, the effect of which you'll hear about later on. But now, it no longer prevents me, so here I am. I'm confident it won't prevent me in future either. I've been observing you all this time and I've got a pretty good idea how you treated all those men who pursued you. They held themselves in high esteem, but you were even more arrogant and sent them packing, every single one of them. I'd like to explain the reason why you felt yourself so superior. You say you don't need anybody for anything, since your own qualities from your body right up to your soul are so great there's nothing you lack. In the first place, you fancy yourself the tallest and best-looking man around, and it's quite plain to see you're not wrong about that. Next, you think that yours is the leading family in your city, which is the greatest city in Greece. On your father's side, you have plenty of aristocratic friends and relations who would be of service to you if there was any need, and on your mother's side, your connections are no worse and no fewer. And you have Pericles, son of Xanthippus, whom your father left as guardian to you and your brother. You think he's a more powerful ally than all those people I mentioned put together. He can do whatever he likes, not only in this city, but anywhere in Greece, and also in many important foreign countries. I will also mention your wealth, but I think that's the least of the reasons you hold yourself in high esteem, you bragged about all those things and got the better of your suitors. They didn't measure up and came off the worse. You knew what was going on. And so I'm sure you're wondering what I could possibly have in mind. Why don't I give up on you? The others have all been sent packing. So what do I hope to achieve by persisting? Yes, Socrates, perhaps you don't realise that you've just taken the words out of my mouth. I had already decided to come and ask you that very question. What could you have in mind? What do you hope to achieve by bothering me? Always making so sure you're there wherever I am? Yes, I really do wonder what you might be up to. And I'd be very glad to find out. So then you'll probably be eager to give me your full attention, since, as you say, you're keen to know what I have in mind. I take it that you'll listen carefully. Yes, of course. Just tell me. Watch out. I wouldn't be at all surprised if I found it as hard to stop as it was to start. Tell me, please. I will pay attention. Speak, I must then. It's not easy to play the role of suitor with a man who doesn't give in to them. Nevertheless, I must summon up my courage and say what's on my mind. Alcibiades, if I saw that you were content with the advantages I just mentioned and thought that this was the condition in which you should live out the rest of your life, I would have given up on you long ago. At least that's what I persuade myself. But I'm going to prove to you in person what very different plans you actually have in mind. Then you'll realise how constantly I've been thinking about you. Suppose one of the gods asks you, Alcibiades, would you rather live with what you have now, or would you rather die on the spot if you weren't permitted to acquire anything greater? I think you'd choose to die. What then is your real ambition in life? I'll tell you. You think that as soon as you present yourself before the Athenian people, as indeed you expect to do in a very few days, by presenting yourself you'll show them that you deserve to be honoured more than Pericles or anyone else who ever was. Having shown that, you'll be the most influential man in the city, and if you're the greatest here, you'll be the greatest in the rest of Greece, and not only in Greece, but also among the foreigners who live on the same continent as we do. And if that same god were then to tell you that you should have absolute power in Europe, but that you weren't permitted to cross over into Asia or get mixed up with affairs over there, I think you'd rather not live with only that to look forward to. 
You want your reputation and your influence to saturate all mankind, so to speak. I don't think you regard anybody as ever having been much to speak of, except perhaps Cyrus and Xerxes. I'm not guessing that this is your ambition, I'm sure of it. Since you know that what I say is true, maybe you'll say, Well then, Socrates, what's this got to do with your point? You said you were going to tell me why you haven't given up on me. Yes, I will tell you, my dear son of Clinius and Dinomache. It is impossible to put any of these ideas of yours into effect without me. That's how much influence I think I have over you and your business. I think this is why the God hasn't allowed me to talk to you all this time, and I've been waiting for the day he allows me. I'm hoping for the same thing from you as you are from the Athenians. I hope to exert great influence over you by showing you that I'm worth the world to you and that nobody is capable of providing you with the influence you crave, neither your guardian nor your relatives nor anybody else except me, with the gods' help, of course. When you were younger, before you were full of such ambitions, I think the god didn't let me talk to you because the conversation would have been pointless, but now he's told me to because now you will listen to me. Really, Socrates, now that you've started talking, you seem much more bizarre to me than when you followed me in silence, though you were very bizarre to look at then too. Well, on the question of whether or not these are my ambitions, you seem to have made up your mind already, and no denial of mine will do anything to convince you otherwise. Fine, but supposing I really do have these ambitions, how will you help me achieve them? What makes you so indispensable? Have you got something to say? Are you asking if I can say some long speech like the ones you're used to hearing? No, that sort of thing's not for me. But I do think I'd be able to show you that what I said is true, if only you were willing to grant me just one little favour. Well, as long as you mean a favour that's not hard to grant, I'm willing. Do you think it's hard to answer questions? No, I don't. Then answer me. Ask me. My question is whether you have in mind what I say you have in mind. Let's say I do, if you like, so I can find out what you're going to say. Right then. You plan, as I say, to come forward and advise the Athenians sometime soon. Suppose I stopped you as you were about to take the podium and asked, Alcibiades, what are the Athenians proposing to discuss? You're getting up to advise them because it's something you know better than they do, aren't you? What would you reply? Yes, I suppose I would say it was something that I know better than they do. So it's on matters you know about that you're a good advisor. Of course. Now, the only thing you know are what you've learned from others or found out for yourself, isn't that right? What else could I know? Could you ever have learned or found out anything without wanting to learn it or work it out for yourself? No, I couldn't have. Is that right? Would you have wanted to learn or work out something that you thought you understood? Of course not. So there was a time when you didn't think you knew what you now understand. There must have been. But I've got a pretty good idea what you've learned. Tell me if I've missed anything. As far as I remember, you learned writing and lyre playing and wrestling, but you didn't want to learn aulos playing. These are the subjects that you understand, unless perhaps you have been learning something while I wasn't looking. But I don't think you have been, either by night or by day, on your excursions from home. No, those are the only lessons I took. Well then, is it when the Athenians are discussing how to spell a word correctly that you'll stand up to advise them? Good God, I'd never do that. Then is it when they're discussing the notes on the lyre? No, never. But surely they're not in the habit of discussing wrestling in the assembly? Certainly not. Then what will they be discussing? I presume it won't be building. Of course not, because a builder would give better advice on these matters than you. Yes. Nor will they be discussing divination, will they? No because then a diviner would be better at giving advice than you. Yes.
regardless of whether he's tall or short, or handsome or ugly, or even noble or common. Of course. And when the Athenians are discussing measures for public health, it will make no difference to them if their counsellor is rich or poor, but they will make sure that their adviser is a doctor. Of course. I suppose that's because advice on any subject is the business not of those who are rich, but of those who know it. Quite reasonably so. Then what will they be considering when you stand up to advise them, assuming your right to do so? They'll be discussing their own business, Socrates. You mean their shipbuilding business? What sort of ships they should be building? No, Socrates, I don't. I suppose that's because you don't understand shipbuilding. Am I right, or is there some other reason? No, that's it. So what kind of their own business do you think they'll be discussing? War, Socrates, or peace, or anything else which is the business of the city. Do you mean they'll be discussing who they should make peace with, and who they should go to war with, and how? Yes. But shouldn't they do that with the ones with whom it's better to? Yes. And when it's better? Certainly. And for as long a time as it's better? Yes. Now supposing the Athenians were discussing who they should wrestle with, and who they should spar with, and how, who would be a better advisor, you or the trainer? The trainer, I guess. And can you tell me what the trainer has in view when he advises you who you should or shouldn't wrestle with, and when and how? I mean, for example, that one should wrestle with those with whom it's better to wrestle. Isn't that right? Yes. And as much as is better? That's right. And when it's better, right? Certainly. Let's take another example. When you're singing, you should sometimes accompany the song with lyre playing and dancing. Yes, you should. You should do so when it's better to, right? Yes, and as much as is better. I agree. Really? Since you use the term better in both cases, in wrestling and in playing the lyre while singing, what do you call what's better in lyre playing, as I call what's better in wrestling athletic? What do you call that? I don't get it. Then try to follow my example. My answer was, I think, what is correct in every case, and what is correct, I presume, is what takes place in accordance with the skill, isn't it? Yes. Wasn't the skill athletics? Of course. I said that what's better in wrestling was athletic. That's what you said. Wasn't that well said? I think so, anyway. Come on then, it's your turn. It's partly up to you, surely, to keep our conversation going well. First of all, Tell me what the skill is for singing and dancing and playing the lyre correctly. What is it called as a whole? Aren't you able to tell me yet? No, I can't. Well, try it this way. Who are the goddesses to whom the skill belongs? Do you mean the muses, Socrates? I do indeed. Don't you see? What's the name of the skill that's named after them? I think you mean music. Yes, I do. Now what is correctly for what takes place in accordance with this skill. In the other case, I told you what correctly is for what takes place in accordance with the skill, so now it's your turn to say something similar in this case. How does it take place? Musically, I think. A good answer. Come on now. What do you call what's better in both going to war and keeping the peace? In these last two examples, you said that what was better was more musical and more athletic, respectively. Now try to tell me what's better in this case, too. I really can't do it. But surely it's disgraceful if when you're speaking and giving advice about food, saying that a certain kind is better than another, and better at a certain time and in a certain quantity, and someone should ask you, what do you mean by better, Alcabiades? You could tell him, in that case, that better was healthier, though you don't even pretend to be a doctor, and yet in a case where you do pretend to understand and are going to stand up and give advice as though you knew, if you aren't able, 
as seems likely to answer the question in this case. Won't you be embarrassed? Won't that seem disgraceful? Yes, certainly. Then think about it and try to tell me what the better tends towards in keeping the peace or in waging war with the right people. I'm thinking, but I can't get it. But suppose we're at war with somebody. Surely you know what treatment we accuse each other of when we enter into a war and what we call it. I do. We say they're playing some trick on us or attacking us or taking things away from us. Hold on. How do we suffer from each of these treatments? Try to tell me how one way differs from another way. When you say way, Socrates, do you mean justly or unjustly? Precisely. But surely that makes all the difference in the world. Really? Who will you advise the Athenians to wage war on? Those who are treating us unjustly or those who are treating us justly? That's a hard question you're asking. Even if someone thought it was necessary to wage war on people who were treating us justly, he wouldn't admit it, because I think that wouldn't be lawful. It certainly wouldn't, nor would it be considered a proper thing to do. No. So you would also frame your speech in these terms? I'd have to. Then this better I was just asking you about, when it comes to waging war or not, on whom to wage war and on whom not to, and when and when not to, this better turns out to be to the same as more just, doesn't it? It certainly seems so. But how could it, my dear Alcibiades? Don't you realise that this is something you don't understand? Or perhaps, when I wasn't looking, you've been seeing some teacher who, who taught you how to tell the difference between the more just and the less just, have you? Well, who is he? Tell me who he is so that you can sign me up with him as well. Stop teasing me, Socrates. I'm not. I'll swear by friendship, yours and mine. I'd never perjure myself by him. So tell me who he is if you can. And what if I can't? Don't you think I might know about justice and injustice some other way? Yes, you might. If you found it out, well, don't you think I might find it out? Yes, of course, if you investigate the matter. And don't you think I might investigate it? Yes, I do, if you thought you didn't know. And didn't I once think that? A fine answer. Can you tell me when this was, when you didn't think you knew about justice and injustice? Well, was it last year that you were looking into it and didn't think you knew? Or did you think you knew? Answer me truthfully, or else our conversation will be a waste of time. Yes, I thought I knew. Didn't you think the same thing two years ago and three years ago and four? I did. But surely before that you were a boy, weren't you? Yes. Well now, at that point I'm sure you thought you knew. How can you be sure of that? When you were a boy I often observed you at school and other places and sometimes when you were playing knuckle bones or some other game, you'd say to one or another of your playmates very loudly and confidently, not at all like someone who was at a loss about justice and injustice, that he was a lousy cheater and wasn't playing fairly. Isn't that true? But what was I to do, Socrates, when somebody cheated me like that? Do you mean, what should you have done if you didn't actually know then whether or not you were being cheated? But I did know by Zeus. I saw clearly that they were cheating me. So it seems that even as a child you thought you understood justice and injustice. Yes, and I did understand. At what point did you find it out? Surely it wasn't when you thought you knew. Of course not. Then when did you think you didn't know? Think about it. You won't find any such time. By Zeus, Socrates, I really can't say. So, it isn't by finding it out that you know it. That's not very likely. But surely you just finished saying that it wasn't by being taught either that you knew it. So if you neither found it out, nor were taught it, how and where did you come to know it? Maybe I gave you the wrong answer when I said I knew it by finding it out myself. Then how did it happen? 
I supposed I learned it in the same way as other people. That brings us back to the same argument. From whom? Do tell me. From people in general. When you give the credit to people in general, you're falling back on teachers who are no good. What? Aren't they capable of teaching? No, they can't even teach you what moves to make or not make in knuckle bones. And yet that's a trivial matter, I suppose, compared with justice. What? Don't you agree? Yes. So although they can't teach trivial things, you say they can teach more serious things. I think so, at any rate. They can teach a lot of things that are more important than knuckle bones. Like what? Well, for example, I learned how to speak Greek from them. I couldn't tell you who my teacher was, but I give the credit to the very people you say are no good at teaching. Yes, my noble friend, people in general are good teachers of that, and it would be only fair to praise them for their teaching. Why? Because they have what it takes to be good teachers of the subject. What do you mean by that? Don't you see that somebody who is going to teach anything must first know it himself, isn't that right? Of course. And don't people who know something agree with each other, not disagree? Yes. If people disagree about something, would you say that they know it? Of course not. Then how could they be teachers of it? They couldn't possibly. Well then, do you think that people in general disagree about what wood or stone is? If you ask them, don't they give the same answers? Don't they reach for the same things when they want to get some wood or some stone? And similarly for all other such cases? I suppose this is pretty much what you mean by understanding Greek, isn't it? Yes. So they agree with each other in these cases, as we said, and with themselves when acting privately, but don't they also agree in public? Cities don't disagree with each other and use different words for the same thing, do they? No. So it's likely that they would make good teachers of these things. Yes. So if we wanted somebody to know these things, we'd be right to send him to lessons given by these people in general. Certainly. Now, if we wanted to know not just what men or horses are like, but which of them could and couldn't run, would people in general be able to teach this as well? Of course not. Isn't the fact that they disagree with each other about these things enough to show you that they don't understand them and are not four square teachers of them? Yes, it is. Now, if we wanted to know not just what men are like, but what sick and healthy men are like, would people in general be able to teach us? Of course not. And if you saw them disagreeing about it, that would show you that they were bad teachers of it. Yes, it would. Very well then. Does it seem to you that people in general actually agree among themselves or with each other about just and unjust people and actions? Not in the slightest, Socrates. Really? Do they disagree a huge amount about these things? Very much so. I don't suppose you've ever seen or heard people disagreeing so strongly about what is healthy and unhealthy that they fight and kill each other over it, have you? Of course not. But I know you've seen this sort of dispute over questions of justice and injustice, or even if you haven't seen it, at least you've heard about it from many other people, especially Homer, since you've heard the Iliad and the Odyssey, haven't you? I certainly have, of course, Socrates. Aren't these poems all about disagreements over justice and injustice? Yes. It was over this sort of disagreement that the Achaeans and the Trojans fought battles and lost their lives, as did Odysseus and the suitors of Penelope. You're right. I suppose the same is true of those Athenians and Spartans and Boeotians who died at Tanagra and later at Coronia, including your own father. The disagreement that caused those battles and those deaths was none other than a disagreement over in justice and injustice, wasn't it? You're right. Are we to say that people understand something if they disagree so much about it that in their disputes with each other they resort to such extreme measures? Obviously not. 
But aren't you giving credit to teachers of this sort who, as you yourself admit, have no knowledge? I guess I am. Well then, given that your opinion wavers so much, and given that you obviously neither found it out yourself nor learned it from anyone else, how likely is it that you know about justice and injustice? From what you say, anyway, it's not very likely. See, there you go again, Alcibiades. That's not well said. What do you mean? You say that I say these things. What? Aren't you saying that I don't understand justice and injustice? No, not at all. Well, am I? Yes. How? Here's how. If I ask you which is more, one or two, would you say two? I would. By how much? By one. Then which of us is saying that two is one more than one? I am. Wasn't I asking, and weren't you answering? Yes. Who do you think is saying these things? Me, the questioner, or you, the answerer? I am. And what if I asked you how to spell Socrates, and, told, and you told me? Which of us would be saying it? I would. Come then, give me the general principle. When there's a question and an answer, who is the one saying things? The questioner or the answerer? The answerer, I think, Socrates. Wasn't I the questioner in everything just now? Yes, and weren't you the answerer? I certainly was. Well then, which of us said what was said? From what we've agreed, Socrates, it seems that I did. And what was said was that Alcibiades, the handsome son of Clinias, doesn't understand justice and injustice, though he thinks he does, and that he is about to go to the assembly to advise the Athenians on what he doesn't know anything about. Wasn't that it? Apparently. Then it's just like in Euripides, Alcibiades. You heard it from yourself, not from me. I'm not the one who says these things, you are. Don't try to blame me, and furthermore, you're quite right to say so. This scheme you have in mind, teaching what you don't know and haven't bothered to learn, your scheme, my good fellow, is crazy. Actually, Socrates, I think the Athenians and the other Greeks rarely discuss which course is more just or unjust. They think that sort of thing is obvious, so they skip over it and ask which one would be advantageous to do. In fact, though, what's just is not the same, I think, as what's advantageous. Many people have profited by committing great injustices, and others, I think, got no advantage from doing the right thing. So, even if just and advantageous things happen to be completely different, surely you don't think you know what's advantageous for people, and why do you? What's to stop me, Socrates, unless you're going to ask me all over again who I learned it from, or how I found it out myself? What a way of carrying on. If you say something wrong, and if there's a previous argument that can prove that it was wrong, you think you ought to be given some new and different proof, as if the previous one were a worn-out scrap of clothing that you refuse to wear again. No, you want an immaculate brand new proof. I'll pass over your anticipation of my argument and ask you all the same. How did you come to understand what is advantageous? Who was your teacher? And in my one question, ask everything I asked you before. Clearly this will put you in the same position again. You won't be able to prove that you know what is advantageous, either by finding it out or by learning it. But since you've got a delicate stomach and wouldn't enjoy another taste of the same argument, I'll pass over this question of whether or not you know what is advantageous for the Athenians. But why don't you prove whether the just and the advantageous are the same or different? You can question me if you like, as I question you, or else work it out yourself in your own argument. No, Socrates, I don't think I'd be able to work it out in front of you. Well then, my good sir, imagine that I'm the assembly and the people gathered there. Even there, you know, you'll have to persuade them one by one, isn't that right? Yes. If somebody knows something, 
Don't you think he can persuade people about it one by one as well as all together? Take the school teacher. Don't you think he persuades people about letters individually as well as collectively? Yes. And won't the same person be able to persuade people about numbers individually as well as in groups? Yes. He would be a mathematician, someone who knows about numbers. Certainly. So won't you also be able to persuade an individual person about the things you can, can persuade a group of people about? Probably. Obviously, these are things you know about. Yes. Is there any difference between an orator speaking to the people and an orator speaking in this sort of conversation, except in so far as the former persuades them altogether, while the latter persuades them one by one? I guess not. Well then, since it's plain that the same person can persuade individuals as well as groups, practice on me and try to prove that what is just is sometimes not advantageous. Stop pushing me around, Socrates. No, in fact I'm going to push you around and persuade you of the opposite, of what you're not willing to show me. Just try it. Just answer my questions. No, you do the talking yourself. What? Don't you want to be completely convinced? Absolutely, I'm sure. Wouldn't you be completely convinced if you yourself said, yes, that's how it is? Yes, I think so. Then answer my questions. And if you don't hear yourself say that just things are all so advantageous, then don't believe anything else I say. No, I'm sure I won't, but I'd better answer. I don't think I'll come to any harm. You're quite a prophet. Now tell me, are you saying that some just things are advantageous while others are not? Yes. Really? Are some of them admirable and others not admirable? What do you mean by that question? Have you ever thought that someone was doing something that was both just and contemptible? No, I haven't. So all just things are admirable? Yes. Now, what about admirable things? Are they all good or are some good and others not good? What I think, Socrates, is that some admirable things are bad, and some contemptible things are good? Yes. Are you thinking of this sort of case? Many people get wounded and killed trying to rescue their friends and relatives in battle, while those who don't go to rescue them, as they should, escape safe and sound. Is this what you're referring to? Exactly. Now, you call a rescue of this sort admirable, in that it's an attempt to help the people whom you should help, and this is what courage is. Isn't that what you're saying? Yes. But you call it bad in that it involves wounds and death, don't you? Yes. Now courage is one thing, and death is something else, right? Certainly. So it's not on the same basis that rescuing your friends is admirable and bad, is it? Apparently not. Now, let's see whether, in so far as it's admirable, it's also good, as indeed it is. You agree that the rescue is admirable, and that it's courageous. Now consider this very thing, courage. Is it good or bad? Look at it like this. Which would you rather have, good things or bad things? Good things. Namely, the greatest goods? Very much so. And wouldn't you be least willing to be deprived of such things? Of course. What would you say about courage? How much would you have to be offered to be deprived of that? I wouldn't even want to go on living if I were a coward. So you think that cowardice is the worst thing in the world? I do. On a par with death, it would seem. That's what I say. Aren't life and courage the extreme opposites of death and cowardice? Yes. And wouldn't you want the former most and the latter least? Yes. Is that because you think that the former are best and the latter are worst? Certainly. Would you say that courage ranks among the best things and death among the worst? I would say so. So you called rescuing your friends in battle admirable? 
in so far as it is admirable, in that it does something good, being courageous. I think so, anyway. But you called it bad, in that it does something bad, being fatal. Yes. Now, since you call this act bad, in so far as it produces something bad, wouldn't you also, in all fairness, have to call it good, in so far as it produces something good? I think so. Isn't it also admirable in so far as it's good and contemptible in so far as it's bad? Yes. Then when you say that rescuing one's friends in battle is admirable but bad, you mean exactly the same thing as if you'd call it good but bad. I suppose you're right, Socrates. So nothing admirable, to the extent that it's admirable, is bad, and nothing contemptible, to the extent that it's contemptible, is good. Apparently not. Now then, let's take a new approach. People who do what's admirable do things well, don't they? Yes. And don't people who do things well live successful lives? Of course. Aren't they successful because they've got good things? Certainly. And they get good things by acting properly and admirably? Yes. So it is good to act properly? Of course. And good conduct is admirable. Yes. So we've seen once again that the very thing that is admirable is also good. Apparently. So if we find that something is admirable, we'll also find that it's good, according to this argument at least. We'll have to. Well then, are good things advantageous or not? Advantageous. Do you remember what we agreed about doing just things? I think we agreed that someone who does what's just must also be doing what's admirable. And didn't we also agree that someone who does what's admirable must also be doing what's good? Yes. And that what's good is advantageous? Yes. So, Alcibiades, just things are advantageous. So it seems. Well then, am I not the questioner and are you not the answerer? It appears I am. So if someone who believed that he knew what is just and unjust were to stand up to advise the Athenians, or even the Peperathians, and said that sometimes just things are bad, what could you do but laugh at him? After all, as you yourself say, the same things are just and also advantageous. I swear by the gods, Socrates, I have no idea what I mean. I must be in some absolutely bizarre condition. When you ask me questions, first I think one thing, and then I think something else. And are you unaware, my dear fellow, of what this feeling is? Completely. Well, if someone asks you whether you had two eyes or three eyes, or two hands or four hands, or something else like that, do you think you'd give different answers at different times, or would you always give the same answer? I'm quite unsure of myself at this point, but I think I'd give the same answer. Because you know it. Isn't that the reason? I think so. So if you gave conflicting answers about something, without meaning to, then it would be obvious that you didn't know it. Probably. Well then, you tell me that you're wavering about what is just and unjust, admirable and contemptible, good and bad, and advantageous and disadvantageous, isn't it obvious that the reason you waver about them is that you don't know about them? Yes, it is. Would you also say that whenever someone doesn't know something, his soul will necessarily waver about it? Of course. Really? Do you know any way of ascending to the stars? I certainly don't. Does your opinion waver on this question too? Of course not. Do you know the reason, or shall I tell you? Tell me. It's because, my friend, you don't understand it, and you don't think you understand it. And what do you mean by that? Let's look at it together. Do you waver about what you realise you don't understand? For example, you know, I think, that you don't know how to prepare a fine meal, right? Quite right. 
So do you have your own opinions about how to prepare it and waver about it, or do you leave it to someone who knows how? The latter. Well, if you were sailing in a ship, would you be out there wondering whether to put the helm to port or starboard and wavering because you didn't know, or would you leave it to the skipper and take it easy? I'd leave it to the skipper. So you don't waver about what you don't know if in fact you know that you don't know. Apparently not. Don't you realise that the errors in our conduct are caused by this kind of ignorance, of thinking that we know when we don't know? What do you mean by that? Well, we don't set out to do something unless we think we know what we're doing, right? Right. But when people don't think they know how to do something, they hand it over to somebody else, right? Of course. So the sort of people who don't think they know how to do things make no mistakes in life because they leave those things to other people. You're right. Well, who are the ones making the mistakes? Surely not the ones who know. Of course not. Well, since it's not those who know and it's not those who don't know and know they don't know, is there anyone left except those who don't know but think they know? No, they're the only ones left. So this is the ignorance that causes bad things. This is the most disgraceful sort of stupidity. Yes. And isn't it most harmful and most contemptible when it is ignorance of the most important things? Very much so. Well, can you name anything more important than what's just and admirable and good and advantageous? No, I really can't. But aren't those the things you say you're wavering about? Yes. So, if you're wavering, it's obvious from what we've said that not only are you ignorant about the most important things, but you also think you know what you don't know. I guess that's right. Good God, Alcabiades, what a sorry state you're in. I hesitate to call it by its name, but still, since we're alone, it must be said. You are wedded to stupidity, my good fellow, stupidity in the highest degree. Our discussion and your own words convict you of it. This is why you're rushing into politics before you've got an education. You're not alone in this sad state. You've got most of our city's politicians for company. There are only a few exceptions among them, perhaps your guardian, Pericles. Yes, Socrates and people do say that he didn't acquire his expertise all by himself. He kept company with many experts like Pythocleides and and Anaxagoras. Even now, despite his advanced age, he consults with Daemon for the same purposes. Really, have you ever seen any expert who is unable to make others expert in what he knows? The person who taught you how to read and write? He had expertise in his field, and he made you and anybody else he liked expert as well, didn't he? Yes. And will you, having learned from him, be able to teach somebody else? Yes. And isn't it the same with the music teacher and the gymnastics teacher? Certainly. I think we can be pretty sure that someone understands something when he can show that he has made someone else understand it. I agree. Well then, can you tell me who Pericles has made into an expert? Shall we start with his sons? But Socrates, both of his sons turned out to be idiots. What about Clinius, your brother? There's no point talking about him. He's a madman. What shall we say is the reason that he allowed you to be in the state you're in? I suppose it's because I didn't really pay attention. But can you name any other Athenian or any foreigner, slave or free, who became any more of an expert by keeping company with Pericles? After all, I can name Pythodorus, son of Isolochus, and Callias, son of Calliades, who became wise through their association with Zeno. They paid him a hundred minus each and became famous experts. I can't think of anyone, by Zeus. Very well, 
What do you propose for yourself? Do you intend to remain in your present condition or practice some self-cultivation? Let's discuss it together, Socrates. You know, I do see what you're saying and actually I agree. It seems to me that none of our city's politicians has been properly educated except for a few. And what does that mean? Well, if they were educated, then anyone who wanted to compete with them would have to get some knowledge and go into training like an athlete. But as it is, since they entered politics as amateurs, there's no need for me to train and go to the trouble of learning. I'm sure my natural abilities will be far superior to theirs. Good God, my dear boy, what a thing to say. How unworthy of your good looks and your other advantages. What in the world do you mean, Socrates? What are you getting at? I'm furious with you and with my infatuation for you. Why? Because you stoop to compete with these people. Who else have I got to compete with? That's a fine sort of question for a man who thinks he holds himself in high esteem. What do you mean? Aren't they my competitors? Look here, if you were intending to steer a ship into battle, would you be content to be the best sailor at steering? Granted, that's necessary, but wouldn't you keep your eye on your real opponents and not on your comrades, as you're doing now? Surely you ought to be so far superior to them that they're happy to be your humble comrades in the struggle and wouldn't dream of competing with you. I'm assuming that you do really intend to distinguish yourself with some splendid deed worthy of you and your city. Yes, that's certainly what I intend to do. Dear me, how very proper it is for you to be satisfied with being better than the soldiers. How proper not to keep an eye on the leaders of the opposing camp, so that you can some day become better than them by training and scheming against them. Who are you talking about, Socrates? Don't you know that our city is at war from time to time with the Spartans and with the great king of Persia? You're right. So since you plan to be a leader of this city, wouldn't it be right to think that your struggle is with the kings of Sparta and Persia? That may well be true. But no, sir. You've got to keep an eye on Midias, the cockfighter and such people. People who try to run the city's affairs with their slave boy hairstyles, as the women say, still showing on their boorish minds. They set out to flatter the city with their outlandish talk, not to rule it. These are the people I'm telling you, you've got to keep your eyes on. So relax, don't bother to learn what needs to be learned for the great struggle to come. Don't train yourself for what needs training. Go ahead and go into politics with your complete and thorough preparation. No, Socrates, I think you're right. But still, I don't think the Spartan generals or the Persian king are any different from anybody else. What sort of a notion is that? Think about it. About what? In the first place, when do you think you'd cultivate yourself? If you feared them and thought they were formidable, or if you didn't? Obviously, if I thought they were formidable. Surely you don't think that cultivating yourself will do any harm, do you? Not at all. In fact, it would be a big help. So that's one flaw in this notion of yours. A big flaw, isn't it? You're right. Now, the second flaw is that it's also false, judging by the probabilities. What do you mean? Is it likely that natural talents will be the greatest among noble families or in other families? In noble families, obviously. Those who are well-born will turn out to be perfectly virtuous if they're well brought up, won't they? They certainly will. So let's compare our situation with theirs and consider, first of all, whether the Spartan and Persian kings are of humbler descent. We know, of course, that the Spartan kings are descended from Heracles and the Persian kings are descended from Achaemenes and that the families of Heracles and Achaemenes go right back to Perseus, son of Zeus. Mine too, Socrates. My family goes back to Eurysaches and Eurysaches goes back to Zeus. 
So does mine too, noble Alcibiades. Mine goes back to Daedalus, and Daedalus's goes back to Hephaestus, son of Zeus. Starting with those kings, though, and tracing backwards, every one of them is a king all the way back to Zeus, kings of Argos and Sparta, and kings of Persia in eternity, and sometimes of Asia too, as they are now. But you and I are private citizens, as were our fathers, and if you had to show off your ancestors and Salamis, the native land of Eurysaches, to Artaxerxes, son of Xerxes, or Aegina, the native land of Aeacus, the ancestor of Eurysaches, don't you realise how much you'd be laughed at? But you think we're equal of those men in dignity of our descent, as well as in our upbringing. Haven't you noticed what a commanding position the Spartan kings enjoy? Their wives are guarded at public expense by the ephors, so as to ensure as far as possible that their kings are descended from the family of the Heraclidae alone. And as for the Persian kings, his position is so supreme that nobody so much as suspects his heir of being fathered by anybody but him. That's why his queen is left unguarded except by fear. When the eldest son and heir to the throne is born, all the king's subjects have a feast day. Then, in the years that follow, the whole of Asia celebrates that day, the king's birthday, with further sacrifice and feasting. But when we are born, Alcibiades, even the neighbours hardly notice it, as the comic poet says. Then the boy is brought up not by some nanny of no account, but by the most highly respected eunuchs in the royal household. They attend to all the needs of the infant child and are especially concerned to make him as handsome as possible, shaping and straightening his infant limbs, and for this they are held in great esteem. When the boys reach seven years of age, they take up horseback riding with their instructors and begin to hunt wild game. When he is twice seven years, the boy is entrusted to people called the royal tutors. These are four Persians of mature age who have been selected as the best, the wisest, the justest, and most self-controlled and the bravest. The first of them instructs him in the worship of their gods, the Magian law of Zoroaster, son of Horamazes, and also in what a king should know. The justest man teaches him to be truthful his whole life long. The most self-controlled man teaches him not to be mastered by even a single pleasure, so that he can get accustomed to being a free man and a real king, whose first duty is to rule himself, not be a slave to himself. The bravest man trains him to be fearless and undaunted, because fear is slavery. But for you, Alcibiades, Pericles chose from among his household Zophorus the Thracian, a tutor so old he was perfectly useless. I could tell you about all the rest of the upbringing and education of your competitors, but it would be a long story and, besides, you can probably imagine the later stages from what I've told you so far. But, Alcibiades, your birth, your upbringing and your education, or that of any other Athenian, is of no concern to anybody to tell the truth. Nobody, that is, except perhaps some man who may happen to be in love with you. Again, if you care to consider the wealth of the Persians, the splendour, the clothes and trailing robes, the anointings with myrrh, the throng of servants in waiting, and all their other luxuries, you'd be ashamed of your circumstances, because you'd see how inferior they are to theirs. Again, if you care to consider the self-control and the decorum of the Spartans, their confidence and their composure, their self-esteem and their discipline, their courage and their fortitude and their love of hardship, victory and honour, you'd consider yourself a mere child in all these respects. Again, we'd better discuss your wealth, Alcambiades, if you're to see where you stand. You may devote yourself to it and think it makes you something, but if you care to look at the wealth of the Spartans, you'd realise that it greatly exceeds ours in Athens. They have land of their own and in Mezine that not a single one of our estates could compete with, not in side, nor in quality, nor in slaves, especially helots. 
nor even in horses, nor in the other livestock grazing in Messim. But I'll pass over all that. There is more gold and silver in Sparta in private hands than in the rest of Greece put together. It's been coming into them for many generations, pouring in from all of Greece's cities, and often from foreign cities too, and it never goes out again. It's just like what the fox says to the lion in Aesop's fable. You can clearly see the tracks of the money going in towards Sparta, but the tracks coming out are nowhere to be seen. So you can be sure that the Spartans are the richest of the Greeks in gold and silver, and that the king is the richest of all the Spartans, because the greatest share of these revenues goes to him. Furthermore, he receives a considerable sum from the Spartans, by way of royal tribute. But great as they are when compared with other Greek cities, the Spartan fortunes are nothing compared with the fortunes of the Persians and their king. I once spoke with a reliable man who travelled over to the Persian court, and he told me that he crossed a very large and rich tract of land, nearly a day's journey across, which the locals called the Queen's Girdle. There's another one called the Queen's Veil, as well as many others, all fine and rich properties, each one named for a part of the Queen's wardrobe, because each one is set aside for the Queen's finery. Now suppose someone were to say to Amestris, the king's mother and the widow of Xerxes, the son of Dinomache intends to challenge your son. Her wardrobe is worth only 50 minus at best and her son has less than 300 acres of land at Erkia. I think she'd be wondering what this Alcibiades had up his sleeve to think of competing against Artaxerxes. I think she'd say, I don't see what this fellow could be relying on, except diligence and wisdom. The Greeks don't have anything else worth mentioning. But if she heard that this Alcibiades, who is making this attempt, is, in the first place, hardly twenty years old yet, and secondly, entirely uneducated, and furthermore, when his lover tells him to study and cultivate himself and discipline himself so that he can compete with the king, he says he doesn't want to and that he's happy with the way he is. If she heard all that, I think she'd ask in amazement, what in the world could this youngster be relying on? Suppose we were to reply, good looks, height, birth, wealth, and native intelligence. Then, now could be our days, considering all that they have of these things as well, should conclude that we were stark raving mad. Again, I think that Lampedo, the daughter of Leo Tuchides, wife of Archidemus and mother of Aegis, who were all Spartan kings, would be similarly amazed if you, with your bad upbringing, proposed to compete with her son, considering all his advantages. And yet, don't you think it's disgraceful that even our enemies' wives have a better appreciation than we do of what it would take to challenge them? No, my excellent friend. Trust in me and in the Delphic inscription and know thyself. These are the people we must defeat, not the ones you think, and we have no hope of defeating them unless we act with both diligence and skill. If you fall short in these, then you will fall short in, of achieving fame in Greece as well as abroad, and that is what I think you're longing for more than anyone else ever longed for anything. Well, Socrates, what kind of self-cultivation do I need to practice? Can you show me the way? What you said really sounded true. Yes, but let's discuss together how we can become as good as possible. You know, what I've said about the need for education applies to me as well as to you. We're in the same condition, except in one respect. What? My guardian is better and wiser than Pericles, your guardian. Who's that, Socrates? God, Alcibiades. It was a god who prevented me from talking with you before today. I put my faith in him, and I say that your glory will be entirely my doing. You're teasing me, Socrates. Maybe, but I'm right in saying that we stand in need of self-cultivation. Actually, every human being needs self-cultivation, but especially the two of us. You're right about me and about me. So what should we do? 
There must be no giving up, my friend, and no slacking off. No, Socrates, that really wouldn't do. No, it wouldn't. So let's work it out together. Tell me, we say that we want to be as good as possible, don't we? Yes. In what respect? In what good men do, obviously. Good at what? Taking care of things, obviously. What sorts of things? Horses? Of course not. In that case, we'd consult a horse expert. Yes. Well, do you mean sailing? No. In that case, we'd consult a sailing expert. Yes. Well, what sort of things? Whose business is it? The leading citizens of Athens. By leading citizens, do you mean clever men or stupid men? Clever. But isn't everybody good at what they're clever at? Yes. And bad at what they're not? Of course. And is a shoemaker clever at making shoes? Certainly. Then he's good at it? That's right. Well now, isn't the shoemaker stupid at making clothes? Yes. So he's bad at that? Yes. So the same person is both good and bad, at least by this argument. Apparently. Do you mean to say that good men are also bad? Of course not. So which ones do you say are good men? I mean those with the ability to rule the city, but not, I presume, over horses. No, of course not. Over people? Yes. When they're sick? No. When they're at sea? No. When they're harvesting? No. When they're doing nothing? Or when they're doing something? Doing something. Doing what? Try to make it clear for me. It's when they're helping each other and dealing with each other, as we do in our urban way of life. So you mean ruling over men who deal with men? Yes. Over the boatswains who deal with rowers? Of course not. That's what the pilot is good at. Yes. Do you mean ruling over flute players who direct the singers and deal with the dancers? Of course not. Again. That's what the chorus master is good at. Certainly. So what do you mean by being able to rule over men who deal with men? I mean ruling over the men in the city who take part in citizenship and who make a mutual contribution. Well, what skill is this? Suppose I asked you the same thing again. What skill makes men understand how to rule over men who take part in sailing, the pilots, and what knowledge did we say enables them to rule over those who take part in singing, the chorus masters, as you just said, well now, what do you call the knowledge that enables you to rule over those who take part in citizenship, I call it the knowledge of good advice, Socrates, but then do you think the pilot's advice is bad advice? Of course not. Then is it good advice? I should think so. He has to ensure the safety of his passengers. You're right. Well then, what's the purpose of this good advice you're talking about? The safety and better management of the city. But what is present or absent when the city is safe and better managed? If, for example, you ask me, what is present or absent in the body when it is safe and better managed? I'd reply, health is present and disease is absent. Wouldn't you agree? Yes. And if you ask me again, what is present in our eyes when they are better cared for? I'd say the same sort of thing. Sight is present and blindness is absent. Again, with our ears, deafness is absent and hearing is present when they're in better condition and getting better treatment. You're right. Well then, what about a city? What is it that's present or absent when it's in a better condition and getting better management and treatment? The way I look at it, Socrates, mutual friendship will be present and hatred and insurrection will be absent. When you say friendship, do you mean agreement or disagreement? Agreement. What skill is it that makes cities agree about numbers? Arithmetic. What about private citizens? Isn't it the same skill? Yes. And doesn't it also make each person agree with himself? Yes. 
and what skill is it that makes each of us agree with himself about whether a hand's width is larger than an arm's length? It's measuring, isn't it? Of course. Doesn't it make both cities and private citizens agree? Yes. And isn't it the same with weighing? It is. Well, this agreement you're talking about, what is it? What's it about? What skill provides it? Doesn't the same skill make both a city and a private citizen agree, both with themselves and with others? That doesn't seem quite likely. What is it then? Don't give up. Try your best to tell me. I suppose I mean the sort of friendship and agreement you find when a mother and father agree with the son they love, and when a brother agrees with his brother, and a woman agrees with her husband. Well, Alcibiades, do you think that a husband is able to agree with his wife about wool working when he doesn't understand it and she does? Of course not. Nor does he have any need to, because that's for a woman to know about. That's right. And is a woman able to agree with her husband about military tactics without having learned about it? Of course not. I suppose you'd say that's for a man to know about. I would. So according to your argument, some subjects are women's subjects and some are men's subjects. Of course. So, in these areas at least, there's no agreement between men and women. No. Nor is there any friendship, since friendship was agreement. Apparently not. So women are not loved by men in so far as they do their own work. It seems not, nor are men loved by women, in so far as they do theirs. No, so neither are cities well governed when the different groups each do their own work. But I think they are, Socrates. What do you mean? In that case, there's no friendship in cities, but we said friendship was present when cities are well governed, and not otherwise. But I think it's when each person does his own work that mutual friendship results. You've just changed your mind. What do you mean now? Can there be friendship without agreement? Can there be any agreement when some know about the matter and others don't? There can't possibly. But when everyone does his own work, is everyone being just or unjust? Just, of course. So when the citizens do what is just in the city, there is no friendship between them? Again, Socrates, I think there must be. Then what do you mean by this friendship and agreement that we must be wise and good advisers in if we're to be good men? I can't figure out what it is or who's got it. According to your argument, it seems that sometimes certain people have it and sometimes they don't. Well, Socrates, I swear by the gods that I don't even know what I mean. I think I must have been in an appalling state for a long time without being aware of it. But don't lose heart. If you were 50 when you realised it, then it would be hard for you to cultivate yourself. But now you're just the right age to see it. Now that I've seen it, Socrates, what should I do about it? Answer my questions, Alcibiades. If you do that, then God willing, if we are to trust in my divination, you and I will be in a better state. Then we will be, if it depends on my answering. Well then, what does it mean to cultivate oneself? I'm afraid we often think we're cultivating ourselves when we're not. When does a man do that? Is he cultivating himself when he cultivates what he has? I think so, anyway. Really? When does a man cultivate or care for his feet? Is it when he's caring for what belongs to his feet? I don't understand. Is there anything you'd say belong to a hand? Take a ring, for example. Could it belong anywhere else on a man but on his finger? Of course not. Similarly, a shoe belongs nowhere but on the feet. Yes. Likewise, cloaks and bedclothes belong to the rest of the body. Yes. So when we cultivate or care for our shoes, are we caring for our feet? I don't really understand, Socrates. Surely, Alcibiades, you talk about taking proper care of one thing or another, don't you? Yes, I do. And when you make something better, 
you say you're taking proper care of it? Yes. What skill is it that makes shoes better? Shoemaking. So shoemaking is the skill by which we take care of shoes? Yes. Do we use shoemaking to take care of our feet too? Or do we use the skill that makes our feet better? The latter. Isn't the skill that makes the feet better the same as what makes the rest of the body better? I think so. Isn't this skill athletics? Yes, absolutely. So while we take care of our feet with athletics, we take care of what belongs to our feet with shoemaking. Certainly. And while we take care of our hands with athletics, we take care of what belongs to our hands with ring making. Yes. And while we cultivate our bodies with athletics, we take care of what belongs to our bodies with weaving and other skills. That's absolutely right. So while we cultivate each thing with one skill, we cultivate what belongs to it with another skill. Apparently so. And so when you're cultivating what belongs to you, you're not cultivating yourself. Not at all. For it seems that cultivating yourself and cultivating what belongs to you require different skills. Apparently. Well then, what sort of skill could we use to cultivate ourselves? I couldn't say. But we've agreed on this much at least. It's a skill that won't make anything that belongs to us better, but it will make us better. You're right. Now if we didn't know what a shoe was, would we have known what skill makes a shoe better? No, we couldn't have. Nor would we have known what skill makes a ring better, if we didn't know what a ring was. True. Well then, could we ever know what skill makes us better, if we didn't know what we are? We couldn't. Is it actually such an easy thing to know oneself? Was it some simpleton who inscribed those words on the temple wall at Delphi? Or is it difficult and not for everybody? Sometimes I think, Socrates, that anyone can do it. But then sometimes I think it's extremely difficult. But Alcibiades, whether it's easy or not, nevertheless, this is the situation we're in. If we know ourselves, then we might be able to know how to cultivate ourselves. But if we don't know ourselves... We'll never know how. I agree. Tell me, how can we find out what itself is in itself? Maybe this is the way to find out what we ourselves might be. Maybe it's the only possible way. You're right. Hold on by Zeus. Who are you speaking with now? Anybody but me? No. And I'm speaking with you. Yes. Is Socrates doing the talking? He certainly is. And is Alcibiades doing the listening? Yes. And isn't Socrates talking with words? Of course. I suppose you'd say that talking is the same as using words. Certainly. But the thing being used and the person using it, they're different, aren't they? What do you mean? A shoemaker, for example, cuts with a knife and scraper, I think, and with other tools. Yes, he does. So isn't the cutter who uses the tools different from the tools he's cutting with? Of course. And likewise, isn't the lyre player different from what he's playing with? Yes. This is what I was just asking. Doesn't the user of a thing always seem to be different from what he's using? It seems so. Let's think about the shoemaker again. Does he cut with his tools only, or does he also cut with his hands? With his hands too. So he uses his hands too? Yes. And doesn't he use his eyes too in shoemaking? Yes. Didn't we agree that the person who uses something is different from the thing that he uses? Yes. So the shoemaker and the lyre player are different from the hands and eyes they use in their work? So it seems. Does a man use his whole body too? Certainly. And we agreed that the user is different from the thing being used. Yes. So a man is different from his own body? So it seems. Then what is a man? I don't know what to say. Yes, you do. 
say that it's what uses the body. Yes. What else uses it but the soul? Nothing else. And doesn't the soul rule the body? Yes. Now here's something I don't think anybody would disagree with. What? Man is one of three things. What things? The body, the soul, or the two of them together? The whole thing? Of course. But we agreed that man is that which rules the body. Yes, we did agree to that. Does the body rule itself? It couldn't, because we said it was ruled. Yes, so this can't be what we're looking for. Not likely. Well then, can the two of them together rule the body? Is this what man is? Yes, maybe that's it. No, that's the least likely of all. If one of them doesn't take part in ruling, then surely no combination of the two of them could rule. You're right. Since a man is neither his body nor his body and soul together, what remains, I think, is either that he's nothing, or else, if he is something, he's nothing other than the soul. Quite so. Do you need any clearer proof that the soul is the man? No, by Zeus. I think you've given ample proof. <laughs> well, if we've proven it fairly well, although perhaps not rigorously, that will do for us. We'll have a rigorous proof when we find out what we skipped over, because it would have taken quite a lot of study. What was that? What we mentioned just now, that we should first consider what itself is in itself. But in fact, we've been considering what an individual self is, instead of what itself is. Perhaps that was enough for us, for surely nothing about us has more authority than the soul. Wouldn't you agree? Certainly. So the right way of looking at it is that when you and I talk to each other, one soul uses words to address the other soul. Very true. That's just what we were saying a little while ago, that Socrates converses with Alcibiades, not by saying words to his face, apparently, but by addressing his words to Alcibiades, in other words, to his soul. I see it now. So the command that we should know ourselves means that we should know our souls. So it seems. And someone who knows certain things about his body knows about what belongs to him, not himself. That's right. So no doctor, to the extent he's a doctor, knows himself and neither does any trainer, to the extent he's a trainer. It seems not. So farmers and other tradesmen are a long way from knowing themselves. It seems they don't even know what belongs to them. Their skills are about what's even further away than what belongs to them. They only know what belongs to the body and how to take care of it. You're right. If being self-controlled is knowing yourself, then their skills don't make any of them self-controlled. I don't think so. That's why we consider these skills to be beneath us and not suitable for a gentleman to learn. You're quite right. Furthermore, if someone takes care of his body, then isn't he caring for something that belongs to him and not for himself? That seems likely. And isn't someone who takes care of his wealth caring neither for himself nor for what belongs to him but for something even further away? I agree. So the money earner is not, in fact, doing his own work. Right. Now, if there was someone who loved Alcibiades' body, he wouldn't be loving Alcibiades, only something that belonged to Alcibiades. That's right. But someone who loved you would love your soul? By our argument, I think he'd have to. Wouldn't someone who loves your body go off and leave you when your beauty is no longer in full bloom? Obviously, but someone who loves your soul will not leave you, as long as you're making progress. That's probably right. Well, I'm the one who won't leave you. I'm the one who will stay with you, now that your body has lost its bloom and everyone else has gone away. I'm glad you are, Socrates, and I hope you never leave me. Then you must try to be as attractive as possible. I'll certainly try. So this is your situation, you, 
Alcibiades, son of Clinius, have no lovers and never have had any, it seems, except for one only, and he is your darling Socrates, son of Sophroniscus and Phaenarete. True. Remember when I first spoke to you? You said that you were just about to say something. You wanted to ask me why I was the only one who hadn't given up on you. That's right. Well, this is the reason. I was your only lover. The others were only lovers of what you had. While your possessions are passing their prime, you are just beginning to bloom. I shall never forsake you now, never, unless the Athenian people make you corrupt and ugly. And this is my greatest fear, that a love of the common people might corrupt you, for many Athenian gentlemen have suffered that fate already. The people of the great-hearted Erechtheus might look attractive on the outside, but you need to scrutinise them in their nakedness, so take the precaution I urge. What precaution? Get in training first, my dear friend, and learn what you need to know before entering politics. That will give you an antidote against the terrible dangers. I think you're right, Socrates, but try to explain how exactly we should cultivate ourselves. Well, you've made one step forward anyway. We've pretty well agreed what we are. We were afraid that we might make a mistake about that and unwittingly cultivate something other than ourselves. That's right. And the next step is that we have to cultivate our soul and look to that. Obviously. And let others take care of our bodies and our property. Quite so. Now, how can we get the clearest knowledge of our soul? If we knew that, we'd probably know ourselves as well. By the gods, that admirable Delphic inscription we just mentioned. Didn't we understand it? What's the point of bringing up that again, Socrates? I'll tell you what I suspect that inscription means and what advice it's giving us. There may not be many examples of it, except the case of sight. <coughs> what do you mean by that? You think about it too. If the inscription took our eyes to be men and advised them, See thyself, how would we understand such advice? Shouldn't the eye be looking at something in which it could see itself? Obviously. Then let's think of something that allows us to see both it and ourselves when we look at it. Obviously, Socrates, you mean mirrors and that sort of thing. Quite right. And isn't there something like that in the eye? which we see with? Certainly. I'm sure you've noticed that when a man looks into an eye, his face appears in it like a mirror. We call this the pupil, for it's a sort of miniature of the man who's looking. You're right. Then an eye will see itself if it observes an eye and looks at the best part of it, the part with which it can see. So it seems but it won't see itself if it looks at anything else in a man or anything else at all unless it's similar to the eye. You're right. So if an eye is to see itself, it must look at an eye and at that region of it in which the good activity of an eye actually occurs and this, I presume, is seeing. That's right. Then if the soul, Alcibiades, is to know itself, it must look at a soul and especially at that region in which what makes a soul good, wisdom, occurs, and at anything else which is similar to it. I agree with you, Socrates. Can we say that there is anything about the soul which is more divine than that where knowing and understanding take place? No, we can't. Then that region in it resembles the divine, and someone who looked at that and grasped everything divine, vision and understanding, would have the best grasp of himself as well? So it seems. But we agreed that knowing oneself was the same as being self-controlled. Certainly. So if we didn't know ourselves and weren't self-controlled, would we be able to know which of the things that belonged to us were good and which were bad? How could we know that, Socrates? No, I suppose it would seem impossible to you to know that what belongs to Alcibiades belongs to him, 
without knowing Alcibiades? Quite impossible, I'm sure. And similarly, we could know that what belongs to us belongs to us without knowing ourselves. How could we? And if we didn't even know what belongs to us, how could we possibly know what belongs to our belongings? We couldn't. Then it wasn't quite right to agree, as we did a few minutes ago, that some people know what belongs to them without knowing themselves, while others know what belongs to their belongings. It seems that it's the job of one man and one skill to know all these things, himself, his belongings, and his belongings' belongings. That seems likely. And it follows that anyone who doesn't know his own belongings probably won't know other people's belongings either. Quite so. And if he doesn't know other people's belongings, nor will he know what belongs to the city. He couldn't. So such a man couldn't become a statesman? Of course not. Nor could he even manage a household estate? Of course not. Nor indeed will he know what he's doing? Certainly not. And if he doesn't know what he's doing, won't he make mistakes? Certainly. Since he makes mistakes, won't he conduct himself badly, both publicly and privately? Of course. Since he conducts himself badly, won't he be a failure? Absolutely. What about the people he's working for? They will be too. Then it's impossible for anyone to prosper unless he is self-controlled and good. Impossible. So it's the bad men who are failures. Absolutely. And so the way to avoid being a failure is not by getting rich, but by being self-controlled. Apparently. So, it's not walls or warships or shipyards that cities need, Alcibiades, if they are to prosper, nor is it numbers or size without virtue. Definitely. So if you are to manage the city's business properly and well, you must impart virtue to the citizens. Of course. Is it possible to impart something you haven't got? How could you? Then you or anyone else who is to be ruler and trustee, not only of himself and his private business, but also the city and the city's business must first acquire virtue himself. You're right. So what you need to get for yourself and for the city isn't political power, nor the authority to do what you like. What you need is justice and self-control. Apparently, because, my dear Alcibiades, when an individual or a city with no intelligence is at liberty to do what he or it wants, what do you think the likely result will be? For example, if he's sick and has the power to do whatever he likes, without any medical insight, but with such a dictator's power that nobody criticises him, what's going to happen? Isn't it likely his health will be ruined? You're right. And in a ship, if someone were free to do what he liked, but was completely lacking in insight and skill in navigation, don't you see what would happen to him and his fellow sailors? I do indeed. They would all die. Likewise, if a city or any ruler or administrator is lacking in virtue, then bad conduct will result. It must. Well then, my good Alcibiades, if you are to prosper, it isn't supreme power you need to get for yourself or the city, but virtue. You're right. But before one acquires virtue, it's better to be ruled by somebody superior than to rule. This applies to men as well as to boys. So it seems. And isn't what is better also more admirable? Yes. And isn't what is more admirable more appropriate? Of course. So it's appropriate for a bad man to be a slave since it's better? Yes. And vice is appropriate for a slave, apparently. And virtue is appropriate for a free man? Yes. Well, my friend, shouldn't we avoid whatever is appropriate for slaves? Yes, as much as possible, Socrates. Can you see what condition you're now in? Is it appropriate for a free man or not? 
I think I see only too clearly. Then do you know how to escape from your present state? Let's not call a handsome young man by that name. I do. How? It's up to you, Socrates. That's not well said, Alcibiades. Well, what should I say? That it's up to God. Then that's what I say. And furthermore, I say this as well. We're probably going to change roles, Socrates. I'll be playing yours and you'll be playing mine. For from this day forward I will never fail to attend on you. And you will always have me as your attendant. Then my love for you, my excellent friend, will be just like a stork. After hatching a winged love in you, it will be cared for by it in return. Yes, that's right. I'll start to cultivate justice in myself right now. I should like to believe that you will persevere, but I'm afraid, not because I distrust your nature, but because I know how powerful the city is. I'm afraid it might get the better of both me and you.